Thank you so much. So I'm Megan Sheffield. I'm uh, stepping in for Natalie um, as she was um, unexpectedly or unanticipatedly um, not able to participate today. So um, this is her presentation and my colleague, um, Allison, who I believe is on, although I, I can't tell from my view, um, but we'll be talking about naturalization for um, SIJS beneficiaries. So thank you so much for having us. And I can't, um, I think I'll go ahead and get started. I'm not sure if um, Allison uh, was able to join. So I'll go ahead and, and start uh, going through it and then she can uh, jump in. Okay, so the um, first step really when you have a naturalization client, um, SIJS beneficiary or otherwise is to screen um, preliminary issues, is the person already a citizen? Um, that's the first step, right? Because we're not going to uh, apply for naturalization for someone who is already a citizen, you know, even if they did not already know it. Then look at the general eligibility for naturalization. Is the person eligible to naturalize? Do they meet the basic uh, naturalization eligibility requirements? And then um, the third step is looking at, is the person deportable? So you can be um, eligible for naturalization, but still be deportable at the same time. So those are uh, some risk factors to look at uh, in any naturalization case. And I see we have Allison uh, joining us. So thank you, Allison. Um, okay, so the first step I talked about looking at whether or not first preliminarily is the person already a US citizen. Um, and that could be at birth, you know, if they acquired citizenship at birth. Um, here, this is under INA 301 and 309 for children who are born out of wedlock. Um, but questions to ask, were the parents married when the child was born? What's the date of birth of, of the applicant? Um, was one uh, parent a citizen or both parents a citizen? How long uh, did the citizen parent reside in the United States before the child was born? Did they meet the necessary residency requirements? There um, have been various iterations um, over the years of the rules about uh, acquisition of citizenship. Uh, the ILRC has a fantastic set of charts that helps navigate um, the various iterations of the law to determine whether or not your applicant or your client um, automatically acquired citizenship at birth. It's probably unlikely um, that you'll see this for your SIJS beneficiaries. Um, presumably that will have already been well vetted if they're represented during the SIJS process. Um, but from time to time, we do see cases um, of LPRs coming to us for naturalization um, who are citizens and didn't know it. Uh, there's also derivation of citizenship. So um, this would be your younger green card holders. Um, so anyone as of uh, February 27th, 2001, um, under the Child Citizenship Act of 2000, if they were an LPR under the age of 18 and they have a parent who is a US citizen, either by birth or naturalization, and the child is unmarried, lawfully obtained their LPR and they're in the legal and physical custody of that US citizen parent, um, they can automatically derive citizenship through that parent. So they wouldn't go through the naturalization process there. Um, instead, they would submit an N600 um, for a citizenship uh, certificate through uh, derivation. So the preliminary step, make sure that your client, your, um, your presumptive naturalization client is not already a US citizen. Great, and I'll take over here with those um, naturalization eligibility requirements. So <clears throat> we'll go over each of these in depth, but running through them quickly um, to apply for naturalization, an applicant must at least be 18 years old. So in the context of um, SIJS beneficiaries, they might be much younger than uh, 18 and have been a lawful permanent resident for a long time, but they'll need to wait until they're 18 to go ahead and apply for, for citizenship on their own. Um, we'll also talk through some residency requirements. The person must have resided in the U.S. as a lawful permanent resident. They have to have physically lived here, um, been physically present in the United States. They must show um, a basic understanding of English, be able to speak, read, and write, um, as well as the knowledge of U.S. history and, and civics, be able to pass their civics exam, and, and willing to take on um, the oath of allegiance to pledge their loyalty to the United States. 
in addition to proving that they are a person of good moral character. So um, we will, like I said, go into each of those um, in a bit more depth. So the residency requirements, um, someone must have been lawfully admitted as a permanent resident, right? So um, we need to make sure that they were actually eligible for that lawful permanent resident status. So you'll want to analyze, was there fraud or a mistake when that status um, was obtained? Um, for our SAJS folks um, on their green card, you'll see the SL6, um, that's the green card category um, for SAJS beneficiaries. Um, and you'll want to make sure you're, you know, we'll say this a lot throughout this presentation, reviewing their immigration file and understanding that um, they, were in fact eligible um, for that green card. Um, if they were inadmissible um, at the time of the I-360 or the <clears throat> adjustment, um, did they need a waiver? Um, and if so, uh, was that waiver um, applied for and, and granted? Uh, these are all things you'll, you'll want to make sure you're analyzing and thinking through. So, um, in addition, um, there are some specific residency requirements, starting with the requirement that um, an applicant <clears throat> for naturalization um, must file his or her application with the state or service district that has jurisdiction over their place of residence. So they needed to have resided in that um, state or USCIS district for at least three months leading up to when they um, apply. Um, and so their residence is going to be that person's domicile, their principal actual dwelling, right? Um, so if they've, you know, traveled and um, not been there um, during those three months, that uh, is likely okay as long as they can show that that is their their actual dwelling, their their place of residence. Um, and then we have um, the kind of five year continuous residence requirement. So for most folks, this is going to be the requirement that they've resided as a lawful permanent resident for five years. However, um, there is a three-year requirement that applies for some folks. So these are people who um, most commonly we see spouses of US citizens. Um, so if you're a spouse of a United States citizen, that citizen has been a citizen for the last three years, and you guys have been uh, living together and married for the last three years, um, you might be able to um, apply based on the three-year uh, requirement. Um, some other kind of uh, people that would fall into that three-year requirement are um, VAWA children of United States citizens, spouses of children stationed abroad, some LPRs in the military. Um, there are uh, different roles for asylees and refugees, all things to, to note. Um, but when analyzing continuous residence, you'll, you're really looking at trips outside the U.S. So if someone, your, you know, your client comes to you and has a trip over six months, but less than a year, there will be um, a rebuttable uh, presumption that they did, in fact, break that continuous residence. Um, so you'll want to come prepared with evidence to say, hey, no, they continuously resided um, in the U.S. throughout that time. Look, they didn't terminate their employment, for instance. They had a family that stayed in the U.S. during that time. All, you know, um, the client's wife and kids were all um, back in the U.S. so that you can um, re rebut that presumption that they broke their continuous residence. Um, unfortunately, if you have a client that says, hey, um, actually, two years ago, I was outside of the U.S. for over a year, um, then uh, th there's an automatic break um, to the continuous residence requirement. Um, there are some um, exceptions, um, but they're really rare um, that you can find in the INA. And I would just note, sorry, Allison, just to jump yeah. in that, um, so for most most people, it's going to be they'll need the five years of continuous residence. Um, but to qualify for the three years based on marriage to a U.S. citizen and only need to show having resided continuously for the past three years, um, there's no requirement that they got their green card based on the marriage to the U.S. citizen. So there may be an SIJS beneficiary. Who got, they got their green card through the SIJS. Of course, you want to check and make sure they weren't married before the I-360 was approved. Um, but, you know, if they got married afterwards and are married to a U.S. citizen, um, then they could still apply under the three year, assuming they meet all the other requirements, of course. Great, thanks, Megan. Um, and yeah, and so in 
you know, the continuous residence requirement is really a naturalization eligibility requirement, but you'll also want to ensure that your client has never abandoned their residence, um, which is really an issue of removal. You know, could your client go to their naturalization interview, um, right? Worst case scenario, biggest fear, lose um, their, their green card status. Um, so if, um, a lawful permanent resident has spent a significant amount of time over a year outside the United States. Um, you know, someone comes to you and says, hey, I spent three years abroad. Um, it was great. And now I want to become a citizen. You'll want to make sure you understand what was their intent. Did the person have an objective intent to return to the United States after a temporary visit abroad. Um, so, you know, for instance, during pandemic, early pandemic, um, like March 2020, when folks maybe they intended to go abroad for a month and ended up getting uh, borders shut down and did spend a significant uh, amount of time. Well, um, you'll be able to, um, or you'll want to, again, look at those family ties, property, things like that in the United States to say, um, to show that the person did have an objective intention to return to the United States. Um, and in that case, if in an abandonment issue, the burden would be on the government in removal proceedings to show by clear and convincing evidence that the person abandoned their status. But again, these are things you're, you'll want to make sure you, you understand when taking on um, a Nats case. And then there's a physical presence requirement, which is distinct, um, but similar to the continuous residence requirement. So you remember with continuous residence, you're looking at trips um, outside the US with physical presence. It's, it is what it sounds like, right? The requirement that the uh, individual physically is physically present um, in the United States and for at least half of the time. So you'll either look at the last um, five years or um, the last three years if they're married to a U.S. citizen or fall into one of those other categories um, and make sure that they've spent either 30 out of the last 60 months physically here um, or 18 out of the last 36 months um, physically in the United States. So the immigration officer will be looking at the number of days the applicant has spent cumulatively um, here during the required period. And I would just add that, you know, if someone doesn't meet the physical presence requirement because of the number of days outside the United States, it's not that they can never naturalize. It's just a matter of waiting until that's outside of that statutory period that they're looking at, whether it's based on the five years as a permanent resident or the three years because they're married to a citizen. Okay. Okay, so then there's also a requirement for a naturalization um, that the applicant can show the basic command of the English language, that they can speak and understand English, that they can read and, and write in basic English. Uh, there will be an interview after the application is filed um, with the USCIS officer, and during that interview, that's when they have their, their English exam and their civics exam. Um, to test the speaking and just basic comprehension, that's just the communication uh, generally with the officer um, during the interview. So the officer will ask, you know, basic pleasantries and, um, you know, basic communication at the beginning of the interview. But then the interviewing officer will also go through like the entire N-400 application with them, which it, for those of you who haven't filed one, it's a 20 page application. And some officers will literally read every question on that form. Um, and part of that is, is um, making sure that the applicant is able to understand and to communicate in English. Um, the applicant will also have a reading and writing exam while they have to read um, at least one sentence of, of three chances they have uh, allowed in English. And it's a simple sentence that um, the officer will provide in written form. And then they'll have to write one sentence in English too that the officer will dictate. Um, there are some exemptions to the English language requirement. My guess is most of your SIJ NATS applicants won't qualify yet for these exemptions. Um, but if generally, and in the NATS context, if someone is at least 50 years old and has been living in the United States for at least 20 years as a lawful permanent resident, or is at least 55 years old and has been living in the United States for at least 15 years as a lawful permanent resident, they are exempt from the English language requirement, which means they can conduct their entire naturalization interview in their, um, their native language, and they're not required to do the reading and writing exam. 
there is a disability waiver available uh, for the English language requirement um, that's completed on the N-648 and must be completed by a qualified medical professional. Uh, the, the current version of the form is extremely burdensome. It's like nine pages long, asks a lot of questions, and I think really puts a lot of the medical determinations, or at least it feels like it does, in, in the hands of USCIS. Um, there's a new version um, that hopefully will be out very soon that will be um, the hopefully soon to be the current version, um, which is about half the length um, and really gets to what is the disability um, that has been diagnosed and the main crux is what is the nexus there that because of that disability, um, the applicant is not able to speak or learn um, English and is not able to read and write in English. Um, uh, there's the civics and history requirement. Um, this is an oral exam that's given during the interview. Uh, there's a pool of 100 questions, uh, that uh, 10 of which will be asked during the interview and the applicant only needs to get six right to be able to pass. Um, there was a new um, exam that was released previously, but then was taken back away. So we're back to the um, 2008 exam that's currently being used, although there's a very limited number of applicants um, who may be um, able to take the 2020 exam, but I, I do think it's a lot more complicated and more burdensome. Um, there is an exemption also, uh, well, those who are exempt from the English language uh, requirement also can take their civics and history um, exam in their native language. There's an additional exemption, individuals who are at least 65 years old and have been living in the United States as a permanent resident for at least 20 years, qualify for an easier exam. There are only 20 questions that they have to study from um, to take that exam. And they're actually like the easier of the um, 100 questions um, for the general population. The disability waiver is also available for the history and civics uh, test. It's the same form, um, basically same requirements. You have to show that there is a disability um, that prevents the person from being able to, you know, either learn the information or to be able to complete the exam. Um, aside from disability waiver, there's, there are also accommodations that individuals can request. For example, maybe um, they don't meet the threshold of not being able to go, go through the exam, but they may be able to request an accommodation, um, whether it's asking if the officer can speak slowly and clearly, um, or in some cases we've seen um, for someone who has like a severe anxiety disorder may be able to have um, someone with them in the room to help them remain calm um, to complete the exam. So I will say that um, it does appear that the accommodations that are provided are pretty jurisdiction uh, specific. I, um, I practice in Austin and I'll, the vast majority of our interviews are in the San Antonio field office. And I will say the officers tend to be fairly accommodating. So there's also the oath of allegiance. That's one of the requirements. Basically, you're swearing your loyalty to the United States. You support the government of the United States. Um, one part of the oath is that if the law requires it, you'll bear arms on behalf of the United States. Um, there are some religious exemptions um, to this oath. Um, I think one of the most common examples, if someone is, for example, Jehovah's Witness, and they have document evidence that, you know, that is their faith and that it's against their religion um, to bear arms. Um, there are some religious and moral exemptions to just taking an oath in general, um, but um, those need to be evidenced and argued, um, certainly uh, during the interview. Um, there are also um, some modifications or exemptions for individuals who due to disability may not be able to meaningfully um, take an oath and um, they may have a designated representative who's able um, to complete that portion for them. And we're sort of flying through just the basic requirements because we do want to get into also um, some of the more um, specific issues relating in particular to uh, SAJS beneficiaries. Great. Moral character. So um, 
as we mentioned before, a person applying for naturalization does need to show that they, um, you know, have been a person of good moral character for the statutory period. Um, however, there are some permanent bars, um, meaning even if they occurred outside of the statutory period, so that five-year or three-year period, um, they will still bar them, unfortunately, from ever being able to naturalize. So the um, most common um, scene here is aggravated felony conviction. Um, remembering that the conviction is, you know, certainly, as you all know, much broader in the immigration context. Um, so post 1990, which for, again, SAJS beneficiaries, um, that 